Another final exam, and this one is from Math 265, also known as Multivariable Calculus. Final exam from Fall 2022. Wonderful time to take a final. I know it looks like there's seven problems, but don't worry, there's eight. And that's going to be good times. Of course, we start, as always, by putting down our name, because if we don't write our name, well, we're not going to get the credit. So we put down our name, and we're ready to begin. We can do this. Fighting! Number one, find the equation in parametric form of the line containing the points minus two, minus two, zero, and two, minus one, two. So we're in three dimensions because we have three coordinates here. So we can just sort of sketch and say, all right, what do we have? Well, we have one point, which we can say is here, and another point, and uh, we'll go ahead and label this. This is minus two, minus two, zero, and another point, which, oh, we could say is over here. Two minus one, two. Now you might be saying, wow, how'd you draw those so fast? I didn't, I just picked random points. I'm starting to get a, a picture in mind, right? Because sometimes it, you can have it up here, but boy, it's easier when you see it on the paper. And uh, most of the time we don't have to worry about being too precise. And if we do, we just draw a better picture. Now, what happens is we have two points. And of course, through any two points, there's a unique line. Now, when I'm making a line, I always need to have two pieces of information. Now, the first piece of information is a point. The second piece of information, if we were in 2D, we'd call it slope, but in general, it's a direction. So a point just tells me where do I start, and a direction tells me which way to go. Another thing to keep in mind is the type of way we're expressing the line. Because there are multiple ways to express a line. Now this has parametric form. Now that's very useful because that tells us how we're going to write our answer. So namely our answer is going to consist of the following. So parametric says we're saying what happens in each coordinate system. And so we're going to have some numbers that come in here and some more numbers that come in here, times t. And uh, we just have to say, okay, what goes where? Well, the first is going to be our point, and the second is our direction, and really that comes from a, a vector. All right, so once we know our point and uh, our direction vector, life is good. Now for point, well, we're in luck. We've got choices. Now you might say, which point? It doesn't matter. There's many ways to write a line. And so we just pick one. Well, let's just say the minus two, minus two, zero. There we go. Now we've got a point. What about our direction? Well, now we come to our picture and say, okay, I need a direction of the line. And so how do I find out? Well, if I have two points, I can say, What's the direction between the two points? Because the line is going to go the same direction. So I say, all right, I went from minus 2 to 2. So that says I went up by 4. I went from minus 2 to minus 1. So that went up by a 1. And I went from 0 to 2. So I went up by a 2. So 4, 1, 2 is the direction between those two points. So that's what goes into that space. And, okay, so we'll just rewrite it a little bit more cleanly because who doesn't like a nice, clean answer? Minus 2 plus 4t, minus 2 plus t, and we can just put 2t. And there we go. Life is good. All right, part B. Find the equation of the plane containing the line from part A and the line y equals x in the xy plane. Now, you might be saying, well, okay, so I have two lines. Great. And uh, what do I do? Well, it, it turns out there's a little bit of subtlety here. It's not always the case that given an arbitrary two lines that there's a plane that contains them because they might be sort of at weird angles to each other. And so you have to be careful. Now, we do know that uh, we'll, we'll be okay in this case because, well, it tells us they'll be okay. 
But we also know there's another reason we'll be okay. These lines we know intersect. Do you know how we know that? Because there's a point of intersection. Minus 2 minus 2 0. Well, that's a place where y is x. And we're in the xy plane because it's equal 0. So two intersecting lines will always form a plane. All right. Now, question. How do we find a plane? Well, so for a plane, what pieces of information do we need? Well, that's going to sound deja vu. We need a point, and we need a direction. Aha! Well, direction here is the perpendicular direction. You might say normal direction, because that's what we call it. All right, so how do we find that? Well, oftentimes, the hard part is the direction. A point is free. We know lots of points. We know it contains this whole line. So there's a point. There's a point. Do we know any other points? Well, yes. Yes. Look at that. Look. There's a hint. It contains the origin. Aha. So we could add a point. Zero, zero, zero. And now we're like, we're in business. We're in business. So what do we need? Well, okay. Now that we have a bunch of points, the real key is when I'm looking for the normal, I say, let me find directions inside the plane. We have one for the line. Now we just need to have a direction off the line. And what we're going to do is if I have two directions in the plane, we cross them together and we get something perpendicular to the plane. Okay. So, well, look, I can just go there to there. That's from a point on this line to point zero, zero, zero. And I say, well, what's my direction vector? Two, two, zero. Now, I can use any direction vector I want. I can scale. So how about we scale the direction is one, one, zero. And that, by the way, is the direction vector for the line, y equals x. All right, so here's the key. We know that 1, 1, 0 and 4, 1, 2 are vectors in the plane. And we also know they're not multiples of each other. In other words, they're not parallel. So our normal vector is going to be what happens when we cross them. Now, it doesn't matter which one we put first. And uh, if we get lots of negatives, we'll just change the sign later on. But let's just go through and start working it out. So I put in i, j, k. Then I put my first vector. Then I put the second vector. All right, so what do we have? Well, we'll have i times 1 times 2, 2i. j times 0 times 4, 0j k times 1 times 1, 1k. Now we subtract. 4 times 1 times k, subtract 4k. 1 times 0 times i, 0i. And subtracting 0i, not adding. Ha ha. Well, of course, it doesn't matter because it's 0. So remember, when you go in the other direction, you're going subtraction. 2 times 1 times j is minus 2 which gets us to the vector 2, minus 2, and 3. Now, if we were worried, we said, well, look, i got to get every point I can off this final. There's a check, right? We can dot it with what we started with. So let's say we have 2, minus 2, 0. That goes to 0. 8, uh, minus 2, and 6. Oh, whoops, mistake. Aha, you see, look, 1 minus 4. It's minus 3. Okay, 8 minus 2 minus 6. All right, good. Woohoo! See, that's why we checked, because we want to make sure we get all the points. All right, well, now that we have that out of the way, we have our normal, we have our point. Now, the normal vector is going to give us our coefficients. So these 2 minus 2, 3, we get 2x minus 2y minus 3z is equal to something. And now the question is, what's that something? What's in the box? What's in the box? 
Well, we just have to pick a point in the plane. Which point? Any point. Which one should we pick? The easiest point. Is there an easiest point? Zero, zero, zero. Origin. So we have that zero minus zero minus zero is zero, which means zero goes in the box. So the answer is 2x minus 2y minus 3z is equal to zero. And done. Done. That's it. Ah, wonderful. What a lovely start. You know, you always want a good problem that tests your geometry. And they always like to throw in at least one cross mark somewhere because it, it's just something that crosses your mind sooner or later as you're writing this exam. All right, well, let's keep going. Number two, a particle has acceleration. So it's it, describing our acceleration as a vector function. t cubed, 1, 2t two over 1 plus t squared squared. At time t equals 0, the velocity is 1, 0, 0. At time t equals 1, the particle is located, well, it's a location, 0, 1, 0. Find the position at time t equals 2. All right, let's begin. Okay, so what do we have? Well, we have acceleration. What do we want? We want position. How do we get there? We climb the ladder. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So we're going to take an antiderivative, get to velocity. Velocity is the derivative of position. So we're going to take an antiderivative, get to position. So we're taking two antiderivatives. Now, every time we take an antiderivative, we get constants coming into play. And we're going to use the information to help us solve for constants. Now, there's one small subtle thing, but of course, we're not going to get caught up by subtle things is the times. So at time zero, we're at, well, we're not at, but our velocity is one, zero, zero. But it's a different time, namely at time one, that we have the location. So you have to pay attention because, you know, don't just say, oh, it's always plug in zero. Or, no, no, no. It's, you, if you follow what it tells you. Okay, so we begin. So we start with acceleration. And uh, we say, well, this is really v prime of t. And this is t cubed, 1, 2t over 1 plus t squared squared. Now, so if I want velocity, it's the integral of acceleration. And the way we integrate a vector-valued function is term by term, entry by entry. So we're going to just integrate t cubed, integrate 1, and integrate 2t over 1 plus t squared squared. All right, so when we integrate t cubed, that will give us 1 fourth t to the fourth plus a constant. When we integrate 1, we'll get t plus a constant, but it's a different constant, so we use a different letter. Now here, well, okay, we've got to think a little bit. But remember, the thing about Calc 3 integrals is the integrals are pretty easy. So you shouldn't be like, oh, some weird technique. You should be like, oh, it should be some simple thing. And so don't try to make things complicated when they're not meant to be. Now in this case, what can we do? Well, if you think about it, you say, well, 2t, that's the derivative of 1 plus t squared. So you say, oh, it's a substitution u is 1 plus t squared, du is 2t dt, then this would become the integral of du over u squared, or if you like, u to the minus 2. And I write it as u to the minus 2 because that's the calculus-friendly way to do it, because it, it helps us use the rule. Namely, we add 1, divide by the new exponent, so this becomes minus u to the minus 1, or minus 1 over u plus the constant, and uh, of course, then we put back what u is, and so what we have is we have a minus 1 over 1 plus t squared plus our constant u. All right, now I know what you're thinking. It's like, ah, Steve, you wrote this problem because I already see where you're going with it, Steve. And I actually didn't. 
But you know, I think I've, I've started to convert some of the other faculty. There are now arc tangent believers too. Shh, spoilers, spoilers. All right, now, before we go further, solve for the constants. That's where we use our initial condition. So at time t equals zero, we want to plug in. So uh, initial conditions. We get that v of zero is one, zero, zero. Well, if you plug this in, you're going to get, uh, plugging in zero, you get zero plus c. So that's c, zero plus d, which is d, minus one, or one plus zero squared, which is minus one plus e. And you just start matching. Okay, so c has to be one. Nice. d has to be zero. Cool. And e has to be one. All right, so we now have velocity, writing an update here, is one fourth t to the fourth plus one t and minus one over one plus t squared plus one. All right, good. So we've successfully climbed up one step of the ladder. Now to climb our second step. So position. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, we tend to use something like s for position. So s of t is the integral of velocity. And again, we integrate term by term. So integral 1 fourth t to the fourth plus 1 dt. Integral t dt. Integral minus 1 over 1 plus t squared plus 1 dt. All right, so that will give us, well, we're going to t to the fifth divide by 5. So that's 1 over 20, t to the fifth, and then plus t plus another constant. We're really working our way through the alphabet here. All right, we've already used c, d, e, so we're up to f. Integral of t, 1 half t squared plus a constant. And now the integral of 1 over 1 plus t squared, arc tangent, don't forget the minus in the front. Integral of 1 is t, and plus one last constant. All right, so now we plug in our conditions. When we plug in time t equals 1, we need to be at 0, 1, 0. Okay, so here we go. Our initial conditions is... Uh, well, namely s of 1, excuse me, not 0, 1, is 0, 1, 0. So, that will be, when we plug in 1, we get 1 20th plus 1 plus f, comma, 1 half plus g, comma, minus the arctangent of 1. Now, the arctangent of 1 is pi fourths plus one plus h. And now we say, okay, well, great. That has to equal zero. That has to equal one. That has to equal zero. So what does it tell us? Well, it tells us here, well, one twentieth plus one is twenty-one twentieths. So f is minus twenty-one over twenty. And g is positive a half. And h is pi over 4 minus 1. All right, now I'm running out of space here, so I'm just going to say what happens, and we'll write the answer down. So what's going to happen here is these constants are going to come in. And now we have s. So since we have s, we're basically done, because the question asked was where are we at at time two. So we say, okay, the answer is we plug in s of two. So that's 1 20th times two to the fifth, which is 32, plus a two, plus f. Well, that's minus 21 20ths. Okay, the next term, we're going to get 1 half times 2 squared, and then we're going to get plus a half, 
right? Because that's what g is. And then we have minus arctangent of 2. Arctangent of 2, also known as arctangent of 2, doesn't simplify. Uh, well, such is life. Uh, plus 2, and then plus pi force minus 1. Okay, which becomes what? Well, let's carefully go through here. 32 over 20 minus 21 over 20. Well, that will give us 11 over 20. But we also have a 2, which is a 40 over 20. So 11 over 20 plus 40 over 20 makes the first term 51 over 20. The second term, we have a half times 2 squared, a half times 4, which is 2. Or we could just say 4 halves. 4 halves plus 1 half makes 5 halves. And finally, the last term, there's not much we can do, but we can put the 2 and the minus 1 together. So we get 1 plus pi over 4 minus arctangent of 2. And done. Done. That's it. We got our position at time 2. We slowly worked our way up. We plugged in our values to find constants along the way. And life is good. And we're making good progress. All right, well, let's keep moving right along. Number three, find partial f partial x and partial f partial y for the function e to the minus x sine of x plus y. All right, so partial derivatives. Now remember, when we're taking partial derivatives, the key about partial is only one part is changing. So when I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, I treat y like a constant. So when taking the derivative with respect to x, we say, well, we see two places x are showing up. They're multiplying. And so we're going to use a product rule. So, say, all right, so partial f partial x. So the derivative of the first term, e to the minus x, well, that would be minus e to the minus x. The second term stays as is. Then we have the first term, which is e to the minus x. And the derivative of sine is cosine, leave the inside alone, times the derivative of the inside, which is 1. And, uh, okay, so then we're adding. So the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. All right. Partial f, partial y. Okay, now here, notice there's only one y. We're taking the derivative with respect to y. So we say, okay, e to the minus x is a constant. So I said, all right, so we have the constant. Derivative of sine is cosine. Leave the inside alone times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of x plus y with respect to y is 1. Okay, and so that's it. And we're done. All right, so not so bad. Three points almost. It's just, hey, Remember that when we're taking partial derivatives, make sure that the derivative were uh, the variables, excuse me, <laughs> anything that we're not taking derivative with respect to is a constant. That's what we want to say. That's it. That's the only thing you have to remember about partial derivatives. Otherwise, it's the same as calc 1. So, sure, e to the minus x looks like a function, but with respect to y, it's a constant. All right. Part B. Find the directional derivative of the function f of x, y, z equals 3xy plus z squared at the point 1 minus 2, 2 in the direction from that point toward the origin. And I might be saying, oh, how does this connect to part a? And the answer is, it doesn't. Not at all. And so in other words, the work we did in part a will have no bearing in part b. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it doesn't. And... Uh, in this case, the problem is really teaching us or questioning us, I suppose I should say, about you know derivatives. So part A was about partial derivatives. Part B is directional derivatives because it tells us directional derivatives. Now, when we're doing a directional derivative, there's a couple things that we need. So in particular, when we talk about a directional derivative, we oftentimes write it d uh, u f. 
All right, so there's a lot of things to unpack here. Okay, so certainly the D stands for directional derivative. All right, that's fine. U is a unit vector, because if it's a directional derivative, it has to have a direction. F is our function. And P is our point. In other words, where we're taking a directional derivative at. Because you have to say, what's your function? Where are you taking your derivative at? And in which direction are you taking your derivative at? So that's why we need all this notation here. Now, it turns out, beautiful fact, this is equal to the gradient of the function at your point dot u. Okay. So, whenever you're taking directional derivative, you have to remember this. It's just, it's the key. And if you don't remember it, hopeless, hopeless. All right, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to take the gradient. So let's start with that. So the gradient of f, just in general, well, remember, it's partial derivative. So partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y, partial f, partial z. And here, it's three derivatives because it's a function of three variables. And we go through and just, you know, channel what we did in the first part. So the derivative with respect to x, z squared is a constant. The derivative of 3xy is 3y. Derivative with respect to y, very similar. z squared is a constant. We have 3x times y. So the 3x is acting like a constant. The derivative of y is 1. And the derivative with respect to z, that first 3xy goes away. The derivative of z squared is 2z. 2z or not 2z? That is the question. All right, so we've got the gradient. Now we have to do the point. All right, so the gradient of f at the point 1 minus 2, positive 2. Well, okay, so what will this be? Well, the first thing will be 3 times y. So 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. 3 times x, well, 3 times 1 is 3. 2 times z will be 4. Okay, so now we have this piece. What about you? What's our direction? Well, we are told we're going from that point toward the origin. Okay, so we have to sort of get a quick picture here. Say, so, all right, let's just sort of, we have our, our picture. We say, all right, we have this point. Let's pretend like this is our point. Again, it's not critical that I get this exact. I just want to get some intuition. The origin is 0, 0, 0. So we're going that way. So when you're building up your, your vector u, oftentimes you'll do it in two steps. Step one is get something that points in the right direction. Well, I just need to go from here to there. So we say, OK, that's fine. So what's the change? 1 to 0 was down by 1. Minus 2 to 2, up by 2. 2 to 0 is down by 2, so minus 2. So that is a vector that points in the right direction. Is it u? And why not? Well, it's too long. It's not a unit vector. Unit is very important. Remember, unit means 1. It's a unit circle, circle radius 1. Unicycle is something with one will. Unicorn means you only have one piece of corn, which makes for a very awkward dinner when you have a large family. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we make it length one. So we divide by the length of this vector. Well, that's the square root of minus one squared plus two squared minus two squared. And so one plus four plus four is nine, square root of nine is three. So we could say, oh, that's one third minus 1, 2, minus 2. This is our u. All right, so now we have a unit vector. Don't forget to make sure it has length 1. Don't just trust them that they give you length 1. Make sure it's length 1. All right, so let's put it all together. So our answer will be minus 6, 3, 4, our gradient, dot, our unit vector, 1 third minus 1, 2, minus 2. And so, okay, so that's 1 third of, now remember how dot products work. Again, 
dot product or something that we should anticipate should show up in some way, shape, or form. Negative 6 times negative 1, 6. 3 times 2, another 6. 4 times minus 2 is minus 8. 12 minus 8 is 4. So we end up with 4 thirds. And that's our answer. A directional derivative is a number, a number at the end. It's the rate of change, and so you want to make sure you have a number at the end. So that's good, a good sign. And uh, there we go. We're done. Woohoo! We're just speeding right along. That's okay. We want to make sure we save some time for the ones at the end because those are going to be interesting. <laughs> But meanwhile, on to the next one. Number four. Consider the surface function. Z is 3x squared plus y squared minus 2xy minus 3x plus 5y plus 7. Now, it's not so clear what this surface could be. It could be all sorts of strange things, but that's okay. We don't have to figure out what it is exactly. Part A. Find the equation of the tangent plane at the point 1 minus 1, 5. All right, so now we're after tangent planes. There's two schools of thoughts for tangent planes. So depending upon which school we're in, we do something slightly different. All right, so what are our two schools of thought, just as a refresher? Well, one setting is where you have f of x, y, z equal to a constant c. And then in that case, we say that the normal is the gradient of f at the point. And then we just figure it out from there. The other setting is when we have z is a function of x and y. Now, in this case, it's slightly different. And uh, what we can say is uh, there's a formula. And, uh, well, this is, this is us. OK, so we'll go through it. Just know that you want to be able to do both. Because odds are pretty good. You should expect tangent planes to show up. That's like the big thing in calculus is the flat. You know, calculus is all about flat stuff. Calc 1 is flat lines. And then we get to multivariable calculus, it's flat planes. And then you're like, okay, what's going to happen next? And it's going to be flat, high dimensional things, which, you know, whatever that means. Okay, so, so the formula is the following. And uh, there's a couple ways to write it. And uh, I'll write it in this way. I'll say z minus your f of x naught y naught is equal to, uh, you have your partial f, partial x, x naught y naught, x minus x naught, plus your partial f, partial y, x naught y naught, times y minus y naught. Now, if you were trying to say, well, what's, what is this really saying? Well, here's how it's written in shorthand. Saying our change in z on the tangent plane, and if we're looking for that, well, you look at partial f, partial x, how much do you change in x, plus partial f, partial y, times how much do you change in y. That's, that's really the whole equation. So if you are having a hard time remembering this, just think of that. OK, so here we go. We have z minus what is our function? And you're like, oh, it's going to take us forever. It's right there, 5. Right, because the tangent point at our point, and our point is our x, y, so there we go, z minus 5 is equal to, okay, well, hmm, well, for this, uh, we have to do some partial derivatives. Okay, so, so remember, this is our f of x, y, so what is partial f, partial x? Well, we have 6x, and that goes away, because there's no x, minus 2y, and then minus 3, and then 0 and 0. So partial f, 
partial x at 1 minus 1 would be 6 times 1 minus 2 times minus 1 and then minus 3 which is 5. Okay, so we have 5x minus the x coordinate, 1. All right, well, and, and then we have similar partial f partial y. Okay, take derivative with respect to y, goes away. 2y here, derivative will be minus 2x, goes away, plus 5, and then 7 goes away. So partial f partial y at 1 minus 1. Okay, so 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. Minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. And then 5 is 5, which gets us to 1. So 5 times x minus 1 plus 1 times y minus minus 1. Or if you like, y plus 1. And that's the answer. There you go. Now, you could do a couple of things with this. And, uh, but it's just rewriting. And so let's not rewrite. Let's just keep it as is. Because I like this way. In fact, it, it highlights some things. All right. Now, here's part B. Use the equation of the tangent line, sorry, excuse me, tangent plane, to approximate the surface function value at 1.1 negative 0.9. So in other words, we really have an x and a y. And so the idea is that the tangent plane, it's approximating the surface. That's the whole punchline of these flat things. We have curved things, functions. And we say, well, approximate by flat things, tangent lines, tangent planes, and then use the tangent lines and planes to approximate. Now, let's copy. So we're really interested in z. So the, the punchline is z on the plane is close to z on the surface. So we say, okay, z on the plane, I'm gonna move this five across. So take five plus five times x minus one plus y plus one. Okay, so this is the plane. And so we say, all right, so if I want to know what's happening on the surface, I'm going to plug in. So we have 5 plus 5 times 1.1 minus 1 plus y minus 0.9 plus 1. Well, that's 5. And then we have 1.1 minus 1 is 0.1 times 5 is 0.5. Minus 0.9 plus 1 is 0.1. And so together, 5 plus 0.5 plus 1 gets us to 5.6. Done. On a side note, if you are going to be using your tangent plane to do approximation, that's when it pays not to distribute out, but rather keep it as change in x, change in y. Because then when you carry out the the computation, these pieces are already built to capture, you know, being a small thing. And it helps save you a little bit of, of headache in simplifying. And don't we like it when we don't have to have a headache? I do. I strongly recommend it. All right. Well, uh, four means we're halfway through. Woohoo! That means we still have half to go. Yes! All right. So let's keep going. Number five, find the absolute, yes, absolute maximum and minimum values of f of xy is 2x squared minus xy plus y on the triangular region having vertices 0, 0, 0, 4, and 4, 4. Okay, so let's quickly sketch what that region looks like. So we, we are in the xy plane. We have 0, 0, which looks like this. 0, 4 says 0 for the x, 4 for the y, and then 4, 4 would be over here. All right, so here is our shape. All right, and uh, 
well, it's the triangular region. It's not just the triangle. You really need to have, it's a filled in triangle. So we might have points on the inside. So when we're looking for absolute max or absolute min, what do we do? Well, we, we channel our inner Santa Claus, which is to say that we're making a list, checking it twice, gonna find out which points are nice. So how do we make our list? Well, the list is where could things happen? Okay, so here we go, making our list. Well, corners are always freebie. So any corner always gets included. So we add them to our list, 0, 0, 0, 4, Four, four. All right, now we've gotten the corners, let's do interior. Okay, so for the interior, what are we checking? Well, we check the following. We check where does the gradient equal zero? This is a critical point. You know, it could be a local max or a local min or setup. We don't have to classify. This is not a classify problem, but we find where critical points are. So, all right, what does the gradient look like? Take the derivative with respect to x. We would get uh, 4x and uh, minus y. All right, and then common derivative with respect to y, uh, minus x and plus 1. So we set these both to 0. And what do we see? Well, the second equation is a little bit easier to start with. This says, oh, x equals 1. The other equation says, well, y equals 4x, but we just saw that x had to equal 1, which meant that y equals 4. So this is at the point 1 comma 4. Now, does it make the list? Be careful. You have to check. What you have to check is where is 1, 4? So we have to sort of spot where does 1, 4 fit? So x equals 1, y equals 4. It's just barely on the edge, but it is still in the triangular region, so yes, 1, 4 makes the cut, barely, barely, but we still have to take it into account. All right, now, we've checked the corners, we've checked the inside, even though it turned out to be a point on the, on the boundary. Now we've got to do boundary. So, for the boundary, we just have to go through each piece. There's three pieces here. So, Term by term, piece by piece. All right, well, hmm. Let's start with, say, uh, this one right here. What's special about this boundary? Well, this is the place where x equals 0. So I'm going to say, well, then it becomes a function 0, comma y. So on that boundary, my function is f of 0, y, which is y. Well, take the derivative, and uh, we get 1. That's never 0, right? Our goal here is when we go to the boundary, we're really becoming a function of one variable. So I'm abusing notation here by putting derivative like that, but we're among friends. If I was being a little bit more careful, I'd call it g of y, and then I'd write g prime of y. But the key is get use the boundary to reduce it to a single variable, take derivative. All right, punchline, no points to add. Okay, let's do the top edge. Now on the top edge, this is y equals four. Okay, so what happens? Well, our function, we could say, well, it's now a function just of x, namely f of x comma four, and uh, well, of course, I pulled x down so you can't see it, but there it is. Okay, so it would be 2x squared minus 4x and plus 4. Take the derivative. What do we see? Well, we see 4x minus 4. Set that equal to 0. We get x equals 1, which is that point which we've already found. So, okay, cool. And so we're good, we found that point again. So that's not too surprising. All right, so that takes care of those two sides. Now this last side, this is the slanted side, 
All right, so how do we handle the slanted side? Well, same idea. We'll just say our function now becomes f of x, x. And so we'd have what? 2x squared minus x squared plus x, right? Because I'm just, everything becomes x. And so we plug that in and we get the following. So that would be our x squared plus x. Take the derivative and what do we see? g prime of x is 2x plus 1. Set it equal to 0. And we say, aha, negative a half. Well, where would that be? That would say over here. Do we add that point to our list? No, right? Because it's outside the triangle. All right, see, be careful. Be careful, don't, don't let them catch you. You always have to make sure that any point that gets added to our list is in our region. Okay, we've made our list. And uh, we can sort of check it twice, just sort of make sure, did we get the corners? Did we do the interior? Did we do each edge? Yes, we did. Now, comes the fun part. We're gonna plug every one of these points into our function. So, some of these are easier than others. Zero, zero is an easy one. Zero, zero, zero becomes zero. F of zero, four. Well, x is zero, so we get zero, zero, and four. So that's four. F of four, four. Okay, well, hmm, how do we do that one? Well, okay, we're just gonna be very careful, or we can do a little bit here. We know how to find f of x, x is x squared plus x. So that's like f of four, four is four squared plus four. And so that's 16 plus four makes that 20. All right, but of course you could go through two times 16 is 32. Then you have 32 uh, minus 16, which is 16 plus four makes 20. All right, the last one, f of 1, 4. Okay, so uh, we'll just be careful here. So x equals 1 and y equals 4. So we get 2 times 1 squared, which is 2, minus 1 times 4, so minus 4, plus 4, and which is 2. All right, so recapping. We found our points, made sure we were careful, and now we're going, we plugged them in. We're almost there. We look at these numbers. We ask ourselves the question, what's the smallest? Well, among 0, 4, 20, and 2, 0 is the smallest. So this is our absolute min. Which one's the largest among 0, 4, 20, and 2? Well, 20, that's our absolute max. And then we just double check how it wants the answer. It says find the absolute maximum and minimum values. It doesn't say we have to find locations, you just have to find the values. And so our answers are this. Zero is the absolute min and 20 is the absolute max. And we're done. And we're done. Yep, good. And so these problems are fun. The only annoying part is you have to check the boundaries, and that might take some time, especially if your boundary is not a line, and then you have to start doing more interesting things, but usually the, on a time test, there'll be lines. All right, good. Well, uh, we're doing great. On to the next problem. Number six. And this one has a lot of parts to it. So the, the fancy word I usually tends to be they're scaffolding here, which is like they're building up to something. Well, let's see if we can figure it out. Part A, convert the inequality x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to two to an inequality in spherical coordinates. So it's like, okay, so we kind of have a feeling there's gonna be a lot of spherical coordinates in this problem. Now, if you think about it, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, well, that's just a point, x, y, z, 
I say, okay, well, what's special about a point in spherical coordinates? Well, this x squared plus y squared plus z squared is almost the distance to the origin. And, uh, well, it's almost right. What's the key? The square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is how far it is from x, y, z to the origin. So this is rho squared. So this is rho squared is at most 2. So we say, aha, rho is less than or equal to root 2, because we take the square root. All right. Now you might say, wait, don't I need plus or minus? No. See, the convention is in spherical coordinates, rho should always be greater than or equal to 0, because rho measures distance from the origin, and we should think of a distance as being something which is greater than or equal to 0. All right. So that was good. All right. One point, so it shouldn't be too hard. Going on to part b. Convert the inequality x squared plus y squared greater than or equal to 1 to an inequality in spherical coordinates. Okay. All right. Now, this is a little bit interesting. What's going on here? x squared plus y squared, well, normally we'd say, oh, this is r squared, because that's how we think about things. But we have to be careful here, because we're in spherical coordinates. And so if we were in cylindrical coordinates or polar coordinates, we'd be done. But we're in spherical. So we have to stop and say, OK, well, how does r relate to spherical? OK, so coming back to our picture, because, well, we should always come back to a picture, right? So we, we know we have rho is this distance. Well, if you drop straight down, this distance is r. It's how you far out you go in the xy plane. And over here, this distance is z. Now, what does all this have to do with spherical coordinates? You have this angle that comes into play, which is phi. Now, we think of phi as how far, you know, if we have the z-axis, how far did we tilt from the z-axis? That's what z is. That's how we define phi. But if you think about the picture, that says that this angle phi is the same as that angle up here. So in other words, when we draw our, we, I'm just taking this picture here. So we have r, z, and this angle is phi. So in other words, this angle here is the same as that angle there. All right. Well, the hypotenuse is rho. What can I relate phi, r, and rho? Well, r is the opposite side. So we say, okay, sine of phi is the opposite over the hypotenuse. Or we can say rho uh, sine of phi, right, multiply across, is r. So, what do we see? Well, we see x squared plus y squared is greater than or equal to 1. And that's the same as saying r squared is greater than or equal to 1, which is the same as saying r is greater than or equal to 1. But now we can replace r. So rho sine phi is greater than or equal to 1. So this could be what they're after. But generally speaking, they're after something involving rho. So, we're going to solve for rho. And so we'll divide by sine, and that says rho is greater than 1 over sine, which we can write that as cosecant. And there we go. Rho is greater than or equal to cosecant phi. All right. Well, that was definitely a step up. OK. Now we'll go into part C. Find the two angles, each between 0 and pi for phi, where the surface is x squared plus y squared equals 1 and x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal 2 intersect. All right, so they're giving us a picture here. And we can add, of course, coordinates. So we are trying to find these 
angles here. So in essence, we're find, trying to find these angles. Now let's simplify it. Let's not think of it as a 3D. Let's think of it as 2D. Slice. So when we slice, what do we see? Well, we see a sphere, and our sphere has radius root 2. And now we see that uh, this x squared plus y squared equals 1. Well, that just becomes our r. So this is in our, if you like, this is our rz plane. It becomes r equals 1. So what can we say? Well, here we go. Let's start with this part. If our r coordinate is 1, what is our z coordinate? Well, what do we have? I need r squared plus z squared equals root 2 squared. r1 plus this number squared has to equal 2. So that is a 1. And this number down here, where is that? Well, again, r equals 1. What is z? Well, again, 1 plus whatever this is squared has to equal 2. That's a minus 1. So we say, oh, these are nice angles. We recognize. Now, normally we would call this a 45 degree angle. That's if we came off this way. But it's also 45 if we come from above. So we say, aha, here we go. Our first angle is pi fourths. Now, what about our second? Well, remember, we're coming off the positive z. So we're going to come off. We're going to go pi halves plus pi fourths more. So our second angle would be 3 pi fourths. All right? All right. Pi fourths is from the positive z to the first point, 3 pi fourths from the positive z to the second point. And they, they're even very careful here, emphasizing phi only ever goes from 0 to pi. Uh, why? Well, because that's how far we can go off. Because we only care off the z-axis. So once we've come pi, we've essentially swept out everything possible. You might say, well, what about this point over here? That's where theta comes into play to wrap around. OK, so our two angles, 4 phi, are pi fours and 3 pi fours. All right, so our last part, part D. Use your work from parts A to C to use spherical coordinates to find the mass of the three-dimensional solid where we have x squared plus y squared is greater than or equal to 1, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to 2, and our delta of x, y, z is 2 over x squared plus y squared, plus z squared. Oh, OK, there's a lot going on here. Let's start by talking about these shapes. We have x squared plus y squared is greater than or equal to 1. In terms of the shape, x squared plus y squared equals 1 is a cylinder, so we're outside the cylinder, but we're inside the sphere. We can actually use this picture to help guide us. So we're, we're in this very thin, tiny band that's been wrapped around here. Right, just a small sliver. So that's what we're after. All right. So we know our, our shape here, just that tiny little piece that's been spun around. Say, so, okay, cool. How do we find mass? Well, the way we find mass is we take our density times our volume, which usually we think of as a very small piece of volume, and then we add it up. So this is our mass. So we're going to do the same thing. Well, so we're going to do an integral, 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 our density. So we're in spherical coordinates. How do we know that? Because we've been saying it all along, but it also says to use spherical coordinates. x squared plus y squared plus z squared, rho squared. So this is 2 over rho squared. So our density, 
2 over rho squared. Times our dv. Well, how does dv work for spherical? Now remember that. There's a song. Rho, rho, sine of phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. Yes, right? So rho, rho, rho squared, sine of phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. All right, now we go through, get our bounds. I, I like to tend to work from the outside in, but, you know, however you like it, theta bounds. Well, we go all the way around, fully rotational. So 0 to 2 pi. In fact, nothing depends on theta. So that's going to be very easy and go at the end. Phi bounds. Where does phi go from? That's part c. Pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4. All right. Now, the rho bounds. Here is where parts a and b come into play. So, the inner part, okay, so you have to think from the center, go out. What's the first thing you hit? Do you hit the cylinder or the sphere? You hit the cylinder first. So, as I come out from the center, I hit the cylinder first. Cylinder is going to be my inner bound. So, that's cosecant phi. Then, I'd hit the sphere last. So, that's my upper bound. That's root 2. You can kind of also see it here, right? Cosecant phi is smaller than or equal to rho, so cosecant is a lower bound. Root 2 is greater than or equal to rho, so that's an upper bound. All right, and uh, now all our pieces are in place, and we just have to carry out the integral. And we don't have a lot of space to do it, but I believe in us. I believe we can make it work. So, a few things to our advantage. The row squareds cancel as if they wanted it to happen. We have a d row, and there's no rows left. So the first layer becomes 0 to 2 pi, pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4. We have a 2 sine phi times rho. Evaluate rho equals cosecant phi to rho equals root 2. And then we're going to do a d phi d theta. Okay, so we plug in. So we're still not integrating yet, we're just simplifying. Pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4. Okay, so when we plug in root 2, we have 2 times sine phi times root 2. All right, so that's 2 root 2 sine of phi. Subtract. 2 times sine of phi times cosecant phi. Well, cosecant is 1 over sine. So sine times cosecant cancels. We're left with 2. So 2 root 2 sine phi subtract 2 d phi d theta. All right. Well, that's good. There's no cosecant. Whew. <laughs> I was a little bit worried we'd have to integrate a cosecant. Uh, I don't like integrating cosecants. Not that I can't. I just don't like it. And I know personal biases. I should, I should like all trig functions equally, but uh, cosecant gets annoying with sines. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Let's update. So, integrating our next layer, 0 to 2 pi. So, integral of sine is minus cosine. Okay, got to be careful there, right? The derivative of sine is positive cosine, but the integral of sine is minus cosine. So we're going to get a minus 2 root 2 cosine phi, and uh, then a minus 2 phi, and uh, evaluate phi equals pi fourths to phi equals 3 pi fourths d theta. And at this point, we might be ever so slightly nervous, that's a very negative looking answer, but uh, why, why might that make us nervous? We're after mass. We shouldn't have negative mass. That would be like, ha ha, we've created antimatter. No, no, no. So, but hold on. We haven't evaluated yet. And maybe when we evaluate, things are going to get better. Okay. Well, so we begin our evaluation. 
All right. Here we go. Here we go. So, equals integral 0 to 2 pi. Now, we have to know things about cosine. Well, what do we need to know about cosine? All right. So, if we think about the cosine function, cosine is the x coordinate. So, at pi over 4, we're at root 2 over 2. At 3 pi over 4, we're at negative root 2 over 2. So, keep that in mind. So, we're plugging in 3 pi over 4 first. So, when we plug that in, it's going to be a negative square root of 2 over 2. But you'll see I have a square root of 2. And so the square root of 2, square root of 2 becomes 2 over 2, becomes 1, minus 2 times minus 1 becomes a plus 2. Okay, that's plug in 3 pi over 4. Minus 3 pi uh, over 2 right, because I'm just minus 2 times 3 pi over 4, okay, subtract, now plug in pi over 4, well cosine pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, okay, root 2 over 2 times root 2 becomes 1, there's a 2, so there's a minus 2, and then we have minus 2 times pi over 4, which becomes a, uh, a minus a pi over 2. Well, okay, so this is the integral of 0 to 2 pi. 2 minus minus 2 becomes 4. We have minus 3 halves pi plus 1 half pi. So that would be minus pi altogether. All right, all right minus 3 halves plus a half. And we integrate that d theta. That becomes 4 minus pi theta evaluated from theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi. When you plug in 0, we get 0. And so our final answer is going to be 4 minus pi times 2 pi. Or if you like, and uh, move this up just a little bit, multiply that through 8 pi minus 2 pi squared. Whew. 4 minus pi is a positive number. So that's good. We end up with a positive mass. Whew! Wow, that is a lot of integral for not a lot of space, but uh, we did it. We made it. Woohoo! All right. Well, good. We're through the most of the problems. Two problems left. And uh, let's go ahead and finish those last two. Number seven. Consider the surface S given by Z equals the square root 4 minus X squared minus Y squared. Calculate the surface integral. So we're integrating on the surface the square root of 4 minus X squared minus Y squared d sigma. All right, now, what's the tool? And I know you're probably thinking like, oh, Stokes' theorem, right? Stokes' theorem is about surface integrals, so we should be using Stokes' theorem. No, <laughs> it's not a Stokes' theorem problem. Uh, how do we know it's not Stokes' theorem? Well, Stokes' theorem looks at essentially flows through surfaces. There's something uh, f dot n. We have no f dot n here. This is a more basic question. It's just saying, can we do a, a surface integral? Say, so, okay, so how do you do surface integrals? And so the, the way we do a surface integral is we sort of pull it back and say, all right, we can handle things which are off of surfaces, and uh, we do it in the following way. Let's first off talk about our surface. What is our surface? Now, if you were to square both sides and move things around, you'd see x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4. So that would be a whole sphere. But when you write it in this way, z equals the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared, what we see is not the whole sphere, but it's the part of the sphere where z is greater than or equal to zero. So in other words, it's the top half of our sphere. So, all right, so here is our surface S. All right, half a sphere. Now, what do we do to integrate over our surface? Well, what we'll do is we're going to essentially integrate 
not on the surface, but over the region in the plane that our surface is on top of. So what's that? Well, we're interested in this region here. And so instead of a sphere of radius 2, we're going to look at a circle which has radius 2. All right, so that's our region we're integrating over. So our, our big step is say, oh, translate between our surface to something flat. Then we can use our tools. OK, so we're going to say our integral over our surface of the square root 4 minus x squared minus y squared d sig whoops, d sigma is going to be the integral over our region. So I'm going to call this our region r. Our region r. We're going to write everything in terms of x and y. So we say, OK, we have our square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Well, good news, that's already in terms of x and y. They could have been very subtle and said things like, oh, integrate z. But they didn't. They, they were nice to us. Now the d sigma. How do we do that? Well, that's the fun part. And uh, so for that, we say, OK, d sigma is a part of surface area. So we're going to do some work down here on the, on the side. So if I have a surface, z equals f of x, y, then I can say my d sigma is the square root of 1 plus fx squared plus fy squared and dA, where dA is a little piece downstairs. So this is our, our nice nifty formula. Well, OK, so we're going to have to do a lot of work to clean this up. So we do the work. All right, so patiently we work through it. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is our f of x, y for reference. So, OK, square root 1 plus, when we take a derivative here with respect to x, we have the half comes down. We're going to have 4 minus x squared minus y squared to the minus a half times the derivative of the inside with respect to x, which is minus 2x. And that is being squared plus, same thing, but now take the derivative with respect to y. So not much changes, squared. All right, let's see what we have now. So there's, again, this is the hard part is figuring out the d sigma. All right, so what do we have? Well, notice the half and the 2 cancel. So we have 1 plus, upstairs we have a minus x, but when we square that, it becomes x squared over 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Here, we have a minus y upstairs. We square that, we get a y squared over the downstairs, 4 minus x squared minus y squared. The, you know, here we have minus a half squared. That's why we don't have any square roots left. And the twos and the halves cancel. Now, something should simplify. And something does simplify. What do you see? Well, uh, we can add these fractions together. So this would become the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared plus x squared plus y squared over for minus x squared minus y squared. And do 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 We're left with 2 over the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And uh, of course, I have somehow have neglected to carry that dA down. All right, so there we go. So the d sigma is two over the square root of four minus x squared minus y squared dA. Well, what happens? Nice things. So, okay, what's left? Well, we have a two. We're integrating two over our region. 
So this becomes 2 times the area of our region R. Well, our region is a circle radius 2. And, you know, right, because whenever you integrate 1 over an area, it's over a region, it's the area. Okay, so the area of R, pi R squared. So that's 2 times pi times 2 squared, leaving us with 8 pi. And we're done. That's it. That's the answer. So this was a case where the integral truly, truly, truly was super, super easy. It's the setup. Whoo, what a setup. And it was a matter of, do you remember how to do surface area? Because this d sigma really comes from the surface area formula. So if you remember, if we have a surface area, it's the square root of 1 plus fx squared plus fy squared. That was the key. If you remember that, this problem was great. If you didn't remember that, uh, but we remembered because we're the good students. We're the ones who prepare. And uh, that means we only have one problem left. Noise! Let's go and do that one. Our final problem, number eight. Consider the solid D. So D is our solid, very ugh, enclosed by Z equals X squared. Oh, sorry, excuse me, z squared equals x squared plus y squared, z equals 0, and z equals 1. And s is the closed boundary of d. All right, so we have s is the boundary of d. Sometimes, by the way, this is written as s is boundary of d. And, uh, well, that looks like the same symbol we use for partial. There's a reason for that, but that's another story. Okay, so... Uh, let f of x, y, z is x, y squared plus cosine z squared i plus x squared y plus log x, z plus 1j plus x squared y squared plus z cubed k be a vector field. Now, I know what you're thinking. You probably said along the lines of, no, this looks terrible. I have to do something with cosine z squared. They're trying to make it look terrible. When you see something terrible, it's like a sign. It's not going to be terrible. It's going to be the opposite. So somehow something is going to be nice. What's that nice thing? Well, uh, use Gauss's divergence theorem. Okay, this is our nice thing to calculate the integral on our surface f dot n d sigma. So why is this nice? Well, Gauss's divergence theorem says, oh, there's something about integrating on the boundary versus something about integrating on the interior of a related object. And so, there's some clues here. The word divergence tells us divergence to show up here, and it does. So Gauss's divergence theorem says, oh, this is the same as the integrating on the inside, which is d, of the divergence of f. Dv. All right, so that's what Gauss's divergence theorem says. So we're not going to do the surface integral. We're going to do a volume integral. All right, so first thing is, let's talk about our integral. What is the divergence of f? Well, the divergence of f, that does the following. It says you take, uh, well, this is, I'll write it here. The divergence of f is uh, partial, well, okay, let me just be clear here. So if we call this m, n, and p. So it'll be partial m, partial x, plus partial n, partial y, plus partial p, partial z. In other words, it's partial derivatives. But we don't have to take, you know, it's not a vector. It's you take the partial derivatives and you add them up. And you only have to take partial derivative of, of, of a little part of it, right? Because there are three variables in each of these. But for m, we only take derivative with respect to x. For n, only with respect to y. And for p, only with respect to z. So when we carry this out, what do we see? Well, we get the following. We're integrating over our solid uh, derivative with respect to x. Well, there's only one x, 
dy squared. Derivative with respect to y, well, there's only one y, it's only the x squared. Notice that the really like unpleasant pieces are gone. Mwah! Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, okay, here, derivative with respect to z will be 3z squared. All right, so here's our real problem. All right, <clears throat> well, good. Now we said we have a much nicer problem. We don't have these unpleasant pieces floating around. So now what do we do? Well, uh, let's, let's think about it here. And uh, we, we get the following. We have to think about our shape. So what is z squared equals x squared plus y squared? Well, that is a cone. Right? You could also say that z is the square root of x squared plus y squared. And, uh, okay, so we have ourselves a cone. And uh, we're only going to take part of the cone. From z equals 0, which is the xy plane, up to z equals 1. So here is our shape d. Now we have to decide how we're integrating this. In other words, are we going to go Cartesian? Cylindrical or spherical? And why are we going to go with cylindrical? Right, we're going to go with cylindrical because it's the easiest way to describe everything that's happening. There's no spheres, and so usually if there's no spheres, we avoid spherical, but there's this beautiful rotational symmetry. Rotational symmetry, go cylindrical. And particularly, I should say, rotational symmetry about z. All right, so... Uh, we'll need to do a quick little picture. We're gonna slice our cone here, just so we can get a good idea of what it looks like. And I'm gonna think this as be the RZ plane. So we have this top, Z equals one, and uh, then we have our cone becomes a line, and we just think about spinning this all around. So here we have Z equals R. All right, so we have all of our pieces in place. Now, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we'll update our function. We want everything in terms of r and z, and theta, but in this case, because there's rotational symmetry, theta won't come into play. x squared plus y squared becomes r squared, so we have r squared plus 3z squared. And now, we have to think about how do we do dv. Well, cylindrical says r and, uh, well, dz, dr, d theta. That's the usual way. You can do dr, dz, d theta if you want. I'm just, it's so ingrained into me, r, dz, dr, d theta. I'm just used to it. And, uh, but that's okay. Um, there, there are reasons sometimes to switch. All right, so we have our function. We have our dv, and then we have to do our bounds. So let's go through and figure this out. So I'll write this as r cubed plus 3z squared r. And we have dz dr d theta. Full rotational symmetry. It tells us theta goes 0 to 2 pi. And because there's no theta involved, you can almost pull it off and just say times by 2 pi now. Well r later, doesn't matter. Where does r go from? Well, r, the largest value for r is at 1, so it's 0 to 1. Where does z go from? Well, we go from r up to 1. So, r to 1. Okay, good. We have everything set up. Now we just have to do the integral, and life will be good. Well, okay, so we work through the integral, one layer at a time. It's one of these onion-type things, right? Not that there are tears. There's layers, and we work through one by one. So we have r cubed times z, because we're integrating with respect to z, 
and r times z cubed. And we're going to evaluate from r to 1. And here, of course, I really should say z equals r to z equals 1. So this becomes integral 0 to 2 pi, integral 0 to 1, of r cubed plus r minus r to the fourth and minus another r to the fourth, so minus 2r to the fourth. Right, when we plug in r, r cubed times r is r to the fourth, r times r cubed is r to the fourth, so there's 2r to the fourth, dr. So it becomes 0 to 2 pi, we have 1 fourth r to the fourth, 1 half r squared, 2 fifths r to the fifth. And evaluate from 0 to 1. Good news is when we plug in 0, we get 0. All right, so we just have to plug in the 1. And uh, all right, so that would become 0 to 2 pi. And we have 1 fourth plus 1 half minus two-fifths, subtract zero, dr. Now, okay, what's this? Common denominator would be 20. So you have five over 20, plus 10 over 20, minus eight over 20, right, right? Times five, times 10, times four. Well, uh, 15 minus eight would make this seven over 20. So we end up that this becomes 7 over 20 theta, and evaluate that 0 to 2 pi. Well, plug in 0, you get 0. 20 times 2 pi, well, you can divide out a 2, and so we're left with 7 tenths pi. And that's the answer. We're done. We're done with everything. All right, now I'm going to bet that the solution may have something slightly different in how they approached it. Because I want to point something out. We did dz dr d theta. You could have, you could have alternatively set your integral up in a different way. Namely, it's still the same function. So we'll copy that part again. But now you could have done dr dz d theta. And so you still have the theta going 0 to 2 pi. But where does z go from? Well, z goes from 0 to 1. OK, well, that's not too surprising. Where does r go from? r goes from 0 to z. And if you set this up, you'll have slightly easier terms to work with because you get more cancellation early, right? Here, we didn't have a 0, but here we do you'll get the same answer, and you'll get the full points either way. And so don't be like, ah, oh, I didn't see it. Ah, oh, man, what do I do if I don't see it on the test? The answer is, don't worry. We're not trying to say, read our minds. How did we do it? You better do it the same way or else. No, 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 no. We say, look, here's a problem. We know you have the tools. Do it. And as long as you do it the right way, you're good to go. All right, well, whew, we're done. We made it through. Thanks for hanging out. I hope this has been helpful. Hope you do great. And uh, remember, fighting! You can do this. Bye.